And greetings. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV radio and podcast. I'm Steve Day, so alongside Totters and Aaron McIntyre and all of you. Coming up on today's show, there is a ton going on. We're going to be joined at the bottom of the hour by conservative podcaster Liz Wheeler. Uh, she's going to join us talking about her book, new book, just out, which confirms, yes, they are coming after our children. We'll talk to her about that later on. Uh, we're going to have a guest for Fake News or Not next hour. Good friend of the program returns, Dr. Ryan Cole, who is facing his own tribunal. Funny. Uh, no tribunals for the people that uh, did the killing. Only tribunals for the people who tried to do the saving. But, but that is the era in which we live, and we'll talk to Dr. Ryan Cole about that. But also, what's the latest in terms of COVID, the jabs, the aftershocks, the aftermath, what's happened to health care? Uh, we'll, we'll try to separate fact from fiction with him, and that's why. Uh, he'll be our guest for fake news or not. And then my daughter, Anastasia, will join us uh, at the end of the program. We're going to play two truths and one lie. And guys, I, I think you're not going to figure mine out. I think mine are pretty good. You put money on it? A quarter? Let me see if I have any cash. Are they good because you just stumbled into it or did you like decide after the last few times that you needed to double and triple down and you've spent like a lot of time on this to make sure it was airtight no they're they're all kind of equally cringe that so figuring out which cringe is not the true one i think will be difficult because they're all kind of equally cringe that's very Dacian. It is. It is. We'll get to that here later on in the show, uh, at the very end of the show. And then if in the overtime today for Blaze TV subscribers, I, I saw a movie last week, and then I, uh, I, I commanded Todd and Aaron to watch it as well. Yeah. And, and, and we're going to have Pop Culture Tuesday in the overtime today because we had to double up guests with Dr. Cole. And uh, <clears throat> we have found idiocracy for Gen Z, I think. I think we have. I mean, I'm, I'm confident, but I'm not certain that, that this is parody. It's idiocracy for Gen Z. Aaron, you agree. That's mm-hmm. what it is. Yeah. Todd, you're not so sure. I'm still just trying to overcome that waste of an hour and a half. I mean, not... It was... I mean, you're, you're definitely dumber after having oh, seen this yes. film, correct? That's... Yeah. Yeah. And that's... See, I think that's the point, I think. Which is the only thing left, because I kept waiting for something more... So I think that speaks oh, to Oh, no, your there's faith. just more dumb. Yeah. There, there's nothing more. It's just more dumb. Okay. So we will discuss this film in the overtime today for Blaze TV subscribers at blazetv.com slash dace. That's where you can go later today. We'll record it for you and then upload it there if you're already a Blaze TV subscriber, blazetv.com slash dace. If you're not yet one and you'd like to become one, you know, it's just 10 bucks a month. And that makes uh, that makes sure that you get everything we do here on the network uh, exclusively to you and you don't miss anything without any big tech censorship whatsoever. Just 10 bucks a month at Blaze TV. TV.com slash days. If you're in the market for new glasses, particularly if like me, you're a little far and a little near and you're thinking, oh no, if I've got, you know, bifocals or progressive lenses, that means I've got to get the dorky, you know, Harry Carey Coke bottle frames. Not necessarily any longer. Better Spectacles, a conservative American company. They're offering Rodenstock Eyewear. That's almost a 150-year-old German company. It's the world's gold standard, exclusively available for the first time here in the U.S. And it helps to not just make sure you've got the best technology in your lens, but you also get their outstanding frames. You don't have to wear the dorky frames anymore. In case you're wondering, hey, what do those Rodenstocks look like? It's what I wear on the show every day from our friends at Better Spectacles. So go there. Go to Better spectacles.com slash steve schedule a teleoptical appointment today better spectacles.com slash steve you won't even have to leave your home and they're offering you an introductory 61 percent off their progressive eyewear plus free handcrafted rodent stock frames you can't beat it better spectacles.com slash steve is where you want to go that's better spectacles.com slash steve and with that let's go to aaron for the rundown of what happened while we were away 
What happened while we were away brought to you by Israel Fights Back. The country of Israel continued their counter strikes against the terrorist organization Hamas over the past 24 hours. The Israeli Defense Force has now reportedly retaken all captured settlements around the border of the Gaza Strip. More on that in a moment. Drone footage from Bloomberg seen here shows the aftermath of those airstrikes in Gaza City. The IDF is still working to determine where Hamas took their hostages as the terrorist organization uses a vast network of tunnels underneath Gaza. 300,000 IDF reservists have been called up for duty and tanks have been seen being staged along the border of Gaza as an invasion is expected in the coming days. As Israel retook towns and villages captured by Hamas, gruesome stories have started to emerge. In one town, over 100 residents were found slaughtered. I-24 News had this report from one location where Israeli soldiers discovered unspeakable sights. I'm talking to some of the soldiers and they say what they've witnessed as they've been walking through these different houses, these different communities, uh, babies, their heads cut off. That's what they said. Gunned down, families completely gunned down in their beds. You can see some of these soldiers right now comforting each other. Many of them reserves uh, who jumped into action, leaving their own families behind as well, not knowing the sheer horror that they were about to come to. They say they've never experienced anything like this. This is nothing that anyone could have even imagined. Despite the mounting evidence of atrocities not seen by Western eyes in a generation, pro-Hamas rallies still broke out in various locales around the world, including one in Australia in front of the Sydney Opera House. <laughs> Yes, those pro-Hamas protesters are yelling what you think they are. Gas the Jews over and over again. As we showed you yesterday, those same sorts of rallies have broken out all over the Western world, including many in the United States. All this comes as we learn from U.S. Customs and Border Patrol that over the past two years, they've encountered tens of thousands of quote-unquote special interest aliens at the nation's borders, including over 500 from Syria, over 100 from Yemen, nearly 700 from Iran, over 100 from Iraq, over 6,000 from Afghanistan, over 100 from Lebanon, over 3,000 from Egypt, over 1,500 from Pakistan, over 15,000 from Mauritania, over 13,000 from Uzbekistan, and over 30,000 from Turkey. Back in domestic politics, RFK Jr. announced yesterday he's running for president as an independent. Kennedy explained how his thinking about immigration has evolved over the years. Six months ago, I thought that an open border was a humanitarian policy, and that sealing, if you were for sealing the border, it meant that you were probably a xenophobe and maybe a racist. I was wrong. How did I learn I was wrong? It wasn't just that I listened. It, it wasn't just that I listened to the other side. It was when I actually visited the border and listened to people who weren't on either side. My views changed as I spoke to Border Patrol officers, to local officials, to local sheriffs, to aid workers, and to the migrants themselves. I saw that no one party has a monopoly on wisdom, and none of the simplistic narratives actually contain the whole truth. My promise to you as president is that I'm gonna do this on every issue. I'm gonna to listen to the stakeholders. <laughs> listen to the stakeholders from every side and beyond any side. I'm going to uphold my moral convictions, of course, absolutely, but I'll hold my own opinions lightly. Florida Governor and GOP hopeful Ron DeSantis yesterday blasted the Biden administration's response to the terror attacks on Israel and the borders they've declined to protect in our own country. Well, we have a president that's missing in action. Uh, they've already called a lid on his activities today. We know nine Americans have been killed by Hamas terrorists. They won't even tell us how many are missing. We don't know if any are being held hostage. Joe Biden should be manning the post. Instead, he's asleep at the switch. We have a State Department that's put out both under Blinken's Twitter and one of the agencies in Israel statements talking about not responding and having a ceasefire. Uh, so this is just a total disaster in terms of their response. And yes, I agree with your comments. I mean, if you're looking at Israel 
and all they've done to protect themselves and their borders, and this can happen, do you not think that people that mean our country ill have not been looking at the open border we have and have been exploiting that? We know Chinese have come across, Russians, uh, Iranians, other people from the Middle East. So this is a massive, massive security issue. Uh, Joe Biden, if he wanted to be a leader, he should step up, acknowledge that he's got to reverse his border policy, shut the border down. He needs to stop playing footsie with Iran. There should be no sanctions relief, no money going to Iran. There should be no foreign aid going to Gaza or any Palestinian Arabs. Uh, and he needs to act now because we are vulnerable. And I think this shows uh, it shows that with what happened in Israel. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's Montage is brought Together, to you by why our you- friends over at Jace Medical. Remember, they came out with the Jace case last year to make sure that uh, there would ne- there would not be another um, rebranding of venerable medications as dangerous, right, when they were needed the most. So they wanted to make sure that we had backups of trusted meds like doxycycline, amoxicillin. Well, now they want to make sure that you've got backups of your meds because you never know when the stuff you need might be uh, next in line to be canceled because they're trying to kill you. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Yeah, we'll just go with that. Uh, Anyway, uh, make sure you get a backup up to a year of your meds, whether it is for diabetes, heart health, blood pressure, even mental health, and more when you go to jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E is the website, jacemedical.com. And while you're there, use the code DACE, my last name, at checkout for a discount. Code DACE at checkout for a discount at jacemedical.com. Again, that is jacemedical.com. Speaking of RFK Jr., a lot of you have sent me this email this week. And I I just want to blanketly respond to as many of you as I possibly can. A lot of you have sent me an email asking, is it true that RFK Jr. has been asked to speak at CPAC before you? Kind of. It's like an adjunct event that CPAC is sponsoring. It's not the CPAC conference itself. It's kind of like a supplemental event but yes at that event he was invited to speak i'll leave it up to you guys whether you want to count that on the totem if that gets a if that gets a mark for who gets invited to speak at cpac before i do but so it's not technically the cpac in dc every march or february depending on when they choose to hold it it's uh it's like an ancillary cpac sponsored event so is it smoked we can find it, 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 out. It, it, let's find out, indeed. All right. <laughs> so that answers that question. And I, I've gotten that question a ton um, in my inbox, so wanted to answer it right away. All right, let's get to Aaron's montage. And I, I, the last 24 hours have been a confirmation. Now, if you guys aren't on Twitter, and I know most of you are not, then you haven't seen a lot of this. And you don't inhabit this world. And good on you. Unfortunately, it is a world in, in, in our line of work you must inhabit because it is where all the newsmakers and opinion makers hang out and hash out the narratives that will eventually, as I've explained to you in the past, the, these narratives are crafted up here in Twitter land. This is, this is the city gate of modern times. It is where the, the people who are the opinion shapers and makers, uh, it is where they engage one another. And then eventually, you know, it, it makes its way down via tributaries and, and, and outlets and into the news that you see. Okay. So a lot of you probably aren't privy to what I'm about to say, but I think it's important that even if you are living an existence where you've just decided, I, I get enough of death of the West, I don't, I don't need to mainline it into my veins on Twitter. Not arguing against that, are we? No. No. No, but it's just, that's just part of our job, okay? That, that we have to engage that arena. Uh, to to do this sufficiently without engaging it, we would not be able to sufficiently do the show that you want us to do. And one of the reasons that one of the things you'll listen to a show like this is if you're, this is a supplement for you to not have to engage those arenas. And you listen to shows like this to kind of hear what people are, are saying. And you that, that keeps you informed and you can move on without having to, you know, 
ingest the bile. And I respect that too. So a lot of you aren't seeing this yet. But up here in Twitter or X world where the narratives are being hashed out and hammered out. The American worldview is a mess. It, it's, it's an absolute mess. And, you know, we've said on our show before, worldview is destiny. And the amount of false choices that even smart people are offering up in this era and at this moment is extraordinary. I have watched as, um, as, as people who saw the evil of the scandemic and then the accompanying poisonous jab and then and, and, and aligned with people like us, right, over mm-hmm. the last few years to push back on that narrative have now reverted back to essentially a coexist bumper sticker. Like, there's one really smart guy. He tweeted out today, what's humane about the Israelis killing potentially tens of thousands of, uh, of, of citizens of Hamas and Gaza, over 1,000 of, of their people being killed? As if this just started, like, Saturday. Like, there's, there's no history between these two people at all. This is the first time this worldview has ever attacked the Jewish people in their history. <clears throat> so we're just, we, just, we just kept a scorecard counting on, starting on Saturday, right? And so, I mean, it's just, and, and he thought this was like a really smart take. Like, he really thought this was like, you know, cutting edge. And, and then there are people that have been so worked over by Forever War, Inc. That, that, that now we're not in a position to say anything is evil. Uh, I, I mean, like the opposite of Lindsey Graham is Neville Chamberlain. And there's like nothing in between. There are no nuances, there's no distinctions, there's no looking at things case by case. This is childlike reasoning. It's completely reactionary. And, and let me explain to you where it comes from. We have a tendency in this period of, of human history to confront the specter of evil one of two ways. We either deny that evil is an objective force in and of itself. You think of Dr. James Martin in our movie, Nefarious. Evil is a societal construct. Good and evil are societal constructs, he says. Subjective value statements, meaning that evil is not an objective force in the world. And and those are the people that will immediately jump to concern about punishing the guilty and going too far before they express any sympathy or empathy whatsoever for the victim and the oppressed. And and then we have, and this is more common now, is the second category. People who will only see evil and acknowledge it if it lines up with their narrative or their agenda. So, for example, corporations are bad. That's my narrative and agenda, right? Sure. I see, I see pharmaceutical corporations behaving badly. That affirms my narrative and agenda, correct? Mm-hmm. And therefore, I am now, I give myself moral permission now to acknowledge evil because it affirms my agenda and my narrative. So even in this case, evil is not an objective force. 
but a subjective observation. It comes down to whether you see it or not, <clears throat> not whether it's there, whether you see it or not. Well, we, we, um, we, we did a bunch of bad stuff and, um, therefore we're in no position to even give moral support to Israel. And anything other than, um, we, from America first to America only. Because the only thing, the, 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 the only thing we could do is just become Lindsey Graham and just invade everybody tomorrow. There's no, this is how children think. No distinctions, no nuance. No restraint, no balance, just reactionary from one extreme to the other. This is what it looks like when foolish hearts are darkened. Well, um, you know, if, if you weren't for forever war in Ukraine, then you shouldn't be supporting the Israelis defending their homeland. I, any, have, I've, have I ever said anything about it? I don't, I, I've never objected to the Ukrainians defending their homeland. Have you ever objected to that? No. Have we ever objected to that on this show? No. No, we're just being asked to foot the bill for their homeland. Yes. Against against a, against an opponent that it has that it's questionable whether it's an immediate threat to us and our way of life in Putin and Russia at this point in time, given its stature. Correct. Yes. In the other case, they're capable of defending their own homeland, provided we take the training wheels off and let them do their job and give them political cover. They're the IDF. They're just they're capable of doing this just fine on their own. Correct. Yes. What they just don't want is an American administration undermining them on the world stage every time they go out there to try to do what they now need to do. Yes. Not to mention who did this to Israel. Uh, the same belief system that did this to us on 9-11. The same belief system that the first war in American history, the Barbary Coast Pirates, was against this worldview. So now we have a we have a clear common enemy here a demonstrated common enemy do we not yes a proven common enemy do we not yes that is constant that has been a sustainable enemy is this not true correct correct and i think it's a very important distinction that ron DeSantis made in his statement and by the way he has shined the last few days yes the last few days there's been a lot there are a lot of people running for president right now there has been one man who has indicated that he understands the moment and can communicate it and draw these kinds of important distinctions and his name is Ron DeSantis well Steve you're saying that because you endorsed him you have it backwards I'm not like you I don't subjectively craft truths to affirm myself that's why I'm not as rich as other people in this business that do they'll do that for you I never will in fact, I'll resent you for asking me to. You have it backwards. It's because I anticipated looking at his resume and worldview that he would be prepared for a moment like this that I endorsed him. What do you think I would have done if he would have demonstrated the last few days he was not prepared for this moment? What do you think I would have done? Uh, certainly criticized him, if not walked away from him. Completely altogether. would have done that. Yes. Yeah. You have it backwards. I'm not shocked or stunned. Never felt compelled to text him or call him or send an email. I just assumed if he's the person I endorsed, I assumed he would naturally be able to rise to this moment. And that's exactly what we have seen these last 72 hours, have we not? Yes, we have. Whether he's talking to Morning Joe or Newsmax, he is on message, takes, does not deter from that message, does not go from one reactionary extreme to the other. And he's the only one that's accomplished this over the last few days. The only national figure in the country. And that's why I endorsed him, because I anticipated, based on what he did in Florida and his demonstrated worldview, that would be the case. The problem is our demonstrated worldview is very chaotic. And much of our political discourse these days are these two groups. The one group who just still will not acknowledge objective evil and the other group who will acknowledge it if it lines up with the affirm, the affirmation of whatever their agenda or priorities are at the time. 
I would much rather be talking about other issues than the attempted democide of the Jewish people that was conducted by Hamas over the weekend. Before this weekend, we were talking about other things, were we not? Yes. Had, how, much, how often had we spent a lot of time doing deep dives on the state of Israel and the, and, and, and the West Bank on this show? Can't even remember. Because it wasn't on right. the agenda. But once, it, but once what happened Saturday morning occurred, clearly our agenda must change. Because the objective truth of the objective existence of evil remains the same regardless of what our agenda or our priorities were at the time. And this is where evil is now. So we need to acknowledge and confront that. But it is very clear over the last couple of days, there are very few people, very few I mean, how bad does the how bad does MSNBC have to be prior to today that the that the ADL is out condemning them yeah, to their faces, to their faces? How bad do you think they had to get? It's very clear, very few people have either the worldview for this time or I'm not entirely sure RFK Jr. has the worldview for this time, but I will give credit to him for having the humility maybe for it. Being able to admit, hey, I was wrong about something. I went and looked and checked it out for myself. I got, I, and I didn't listen to people. I didn't take an entourage. I went and did it myself like a grown man. And I saw what I saw. And that, that's not a sustainable country. Credit for that. Yes. Now, eventually, though, your worldview has to be able to instantly rise to the moment. Because if you're going to be commander in chief, you're not always going to have time to, reflect, to reflectively look at things unfortunately, in this world. But ultimately, these two worldview camps exist because they're both making the same mistake. See, they think they're at odds with one another. They're not. They're actually two sides of the same coin. They both refuse to accept the two most important truths of the cosmos. And if you never, ever remember anything I've ever said on this show before or anything I will ever say again for as long as I am allowed to do this, never forget these two things I'm about to share with you. They are the most important truths in the universe. God is holy and owes us nothing. Nothing. He is owed. We broke covenant with him. We sinned against him. He is owed. We owe, he owes us squat. You're not entitled to anything. Air, food, water, nothing from him. And it's only out of his mercy and grace that he provides that of any modicum at all, let alone a deliverer, let alone a lawgiver, let alone a savior. You're not entitled to any of that. Period. Number two, you are a sinner. And you cannot fix yourself. And the worst mistakes in human history have been made when you or people with power like you have tried because then they think they can also fix others. That's it. Those are the two most important truths in the cosmos right there. And they are the two truths that we are the least likely in the contemporary West to accept And that's why we're going to step on more rakes. That's why there will be more ambushes and tragedies like what happened in Israel on Saturday. That's why there will be another large importation of an infestation of the worldview out to condemn us. Like what went on at our southern has gone on in our southern border for the last two years. What's the benign, innocent reason we need to take 30,000 people from Turkey? I'll answer. There is not one. There is not one. Unless you're telling me they're all Turkish Christians. Think they're all Turkish Christians? I do not. Probably not. What's the benign, innocent explanation for why a bunch of able-bodied men are assembled at the border waiting to come in? There is not one. But we will slip on more banana peels. We will step on more rakes. We will fall into more pits whether traveling from the right or the left, if we refuse to acknowledge the two most important truths of the cosmos. And that's the truest thing I've ever said.
Back here on the Steve Day Show, if you are struggling with chronic pain, especially as we get older, chances are that's from too much inflammation in your joints, in your body. So what if I told you there was a 70% chance that a drug-free anti-inflammatory known as relief factor could be the relief that you're looking for? Now, why did I say 70%? Did I just make that up? No. Uh, Over the years, about 70% of those who have taken up Relief Factor on their three-week quick start have seen such great results in just those three weeks that they stick around and are long-term customers of the product. Hence the term, or hence why I said you've got about 70% odds of this working for you. Hey, listen, modern medicine has come up with a lot of great drugs that have healed and helped a lot of people. But if you can do something naturally, that doesn't tax or take away from other systems and organs in the body as a trade-off, take advantage of it. This is a formula created, even though it's drug-free, created by physicians who can prescribe drugs. See if you don't see a difference in your pain level in three weeks or less. When you go to relieffactor.com, it's just 20 bucks. That's the three-week quick start for just 20 bucks. What do you have to lose for 20 bucks to see if you don't see that difference you're looking for? At relieffactor.com, or you can call them at 800, the number four relief, 800, the number four relief, or relieffactor.com. Name of the book, Hide Your Children, Exposing the Marxists Behind the Attack on America's Kids. Conservative broadcaster Liz Wheeler is the author. She joins us now here on the show from the set of her show. Liz, it's a pleasure to have you with us here. Welcome to the program. How are you? Thanks so much, Steve. I appreciate you having me. You bet. So let's start with the who. Who are these Marxists that are coming after the children? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, right? That's the entire first half of my book. But let me give you a couple of examples here because people are going to be pretty surprised when they realize how openly the people that are in charge of training our children's minds admit that they're Marxist. So the president of the American Library Association has been in the news a lot lately. It's an influential woman by the name of Emily Drabinsky. She's one of the biggest proponents of keeping these sexually graphic books in children's schools and books that promote a critical race theory narrative to children. She won her position as president of the American Library Association last year. And after she won election, she posted on Twitter and said, who would have thought that a Marxist could win the presidency of the American Library Association? She admits that her ideology is Marxist, which is shocking enough, maybe not surprising, because we can see that she's pushing Marxist ideologies. But Steve, what's really interesting is that Emily Drabinsky would never have won her position as president of the American Library Association had not Randy Weingarten, the union boss of the Mm. second biggest teachers union in the country, thrown her political weight behind Drabinsky's campaign. Why? Why? Why do they want to deconstruct and deep and and program the children this way with this level of of filth? Why? Why? Two reasons. One, because if you have a communist politician who walks out into any city in the country and tries to sell American citizens on a communist ideology, they might convince a few Bernie bros, a few AOC constituents to vote for them. But by and large, the American public will reject communism and Marxism when it is presented as communism and Marxism. So the Marxists who right now in modern America want to get rid of capitalism, want to get rid of the free market economy, want to get rid of our system of government, they understand that in order to change the ideological fabric of our nation, you can't do that through just votes. You have to do that by capturing the minds of children, forming their mind, the minds of children into Marxist minds before children have a chance to be fully formed in their moral compass, to be able to discern right from wrong. That's the first reason. I mean, I trace the origins of of this thing that we're facing, this wokeness, this umbrella of Marxism back to back to a Brazilian Marxist by the name of Paulo Freire. He contended, and this com- this relates to the education system, that teachers shouldn't be teaching children, students, facts and knowledge, because he was a Marxist, he didn't believe in objective truth. He said instead teachers should be teaching children a worldview, they should be teaching children how to view the world. And he called this worldview critical consciousness. We need to awaken the critical consciousness of children, he said. Well, Steve, this critical consciousness is just teaching children to look at the world through a lens of Marxism, to label everyone as either oppressed or as an oppressor in order to foment a Marxist revolution. And this worldview, critical consciousness, 
it's wokeness. This is this is this is deeply embedded into the classrooms of almost every public school in our country. It's just under a different name because the same communists that know that adults won't vote for them if they if they admit they're communists know that these parents will reject communism if it's taught blatantly to children. So they disguise this Marxist worldview as social emotional learning. So you've used a term that is a big buzzword on our show. In fact, we were just discussing it before you came on worldview. That's one of the driving forces of our program. And if you look at a biblical worldview, St. Paul says that sexual sin is the worst, not in terms of severity of breaking the law, but of the impact upon the, uh, the, the guilty because of what you're sinning against your own body. So you get double the impact. It's not just I committed a sin against somebody else in order to get the better of them or take advantage of them, but I'm getting, I'm, I'm the giver and receiver now in this, in this sin relationship, meaning I, by sinning against myself, I now now essentially create a pox against my own conscience and therefore that 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 style of sin can do more to undo our conscience than just when we act unconscionably towards other people because then we can kind of just justify it or say they deserved it or they had it coming and i'm wondering if that is the ploy here uh, for the demonic ideology and worldview known as Marxism. The, because if you look at a lot of Marxist countries, China is an example, hedonism and those sorts of things are not permitted on any level whatsoever. They're not given all kinds of access to porn in China and things of that nature for free. Um, the sexually explicit material isn't taught in the classroom. They don't do rainbow jihad stuff over there at all. They, they actually view hedonism as self-expression and they don't want to do any of that. So they actually lock it down. So then why do it at a nascent stage with children? Because if you can get them to sin against themselves, you are reforming their own conscience. And that, that sets them up in the future to be completely reprogrammed accordingly, comprehensively. Fair? Right. Plus, it's also, yeah, you're correct. And it's also emotional manipulation. So self-loathing is a really powerful tool mm -hmm. that the left uses. And I'll give you an example. It's no coincidence that critical race theory and queer theory, the transgender ideology, emerged in schools almost one on top of the other. It's it, it, it happened deliberately. And the reason for that is because when you teach children the principles of critical race theory, that white children are racist because there's white and there's nothing they can do about it, they're irredeemable, and black children, they're oppressed, this creates an identity crisis within children, particularly particularly within white children. They feel a self-loathing because they are told they're bad and they're evil, there's nothing they can do about it. And it also creates animosity by these children towards their parents because their parents made them that way. They made them white, they made them bad. So as this identity crisis begins to fester, the self-loathing begins to take over these children's minds, in swoops queer theory, this antidote that tells children, hey, you might have been born with a bad identity as a bad person because you're white, but you can throw off that, that oppressor identity and instead put on the identity of a marginalized, say, transgender person or non-binary identity, any LGBTQIA identity. And in the process, these children feel that their identity crisis has been temporarily healed, although we certainly know that that's not the case. And they're also radically alienated from their parents. And most importantly, they are secured as at the very least, activists for radical leftist causes, if not outright Marxist revolutionaries, because it is the left that tells them that true fulfillment and true identity is found through perversion and promiscuity. Amen. That's very well said. In fact, as you were talking, I got to thinking if someone just tuned into us for the first time and are like, why would you call Marxism? I understand it's anti-American, but why is it demonic? Well, look at what you just said, Liz. I mean, the the, the deconstructing, the, the first time that God formally it gives us in insight into his true character as what he puts on the stone tablets at Sinai for, for Moses, the law, the introduction. This is basically Jehovah 101, the 10 commandments, right? Well, look at the, the uh, look at the 10 commandments that Marxism inherently attacks. Uh, first of all, I am God. Marxism says there is no God. Uh, do not make or forge other gods. Do not commit idolatry. Marxism says the state is God. So we're over to honor your father and mother. You just discussed that for several minutes, very eloquently, the complete detachment of legacy whatsoever and identity. And since I don't, I didn't get Get that forged in the family. Now I'm a free agent and I'm available for you to go ahead and impute that to me and fill that blank, fill in the blank. We discussed the sexual promiscuity angle of it here. Uh, so not committing adultery, um, the entire notion of breaking the world down into the oppressed and oppressors. Well, now we're getting into covetousness. That's another commandment. I mean, we could go the idea of redistribution of wealth. Now we're into stealing. We're, we're basically talking about a, a, an ungodly framework that is the antithesis of the Ten Commandments. 
You're exactly right. And it's one of the reasons I bring up religion in the book, not because I know all Republicans like to talk about religion. A lot of Republicans are very hesitant to. I think that's a mistake. I think it's a delusion to divorce politics and religion because you can't divorce religion and objective truth, which is what our nation was built on. But the Catholic Church in particular, believe it or not, over the course of the past two centuries has been at the forefront of fighting back against communism because, Steve, they were the ones that articulated and acknowledged that communism Communism is a satanic ideology, that it is an anti-Christ ideology. And a lot of people, even in our country, I mean, until COVID, a lot of parents didn't believe that critical race theory was in their children's classroom, that the transgender ideology could reach their kid. It's hard to believe that this kind of evil could be this close to us. It's hard to put a name, a label on this political opposition that we're facing in our country. And a lot of conservatives and Republicans have made the mistake of, of extending too much benefit of the doubt to our political opponents. But the church has for a long time been the one that has identified it properly. And I don't think that this is a mistake. I think that one of the reasons the nuclear family is one of the prime targets of the Marxist left is because the nuclear family is not just a social institution. It's not just a contract between two consenting adults. It's not just, oh, look at that, love is love is love. Mm -hmm. Marriage between a man and a woman is supposed to be representative on earth of Christ's love for his church. Mm -hmm. Children begot of that union are representative of Christ's life-giving love. There's no way to separate the nuclear family, marriage, and children from what it is supposed to represent, which is God's love. Again, I know a lot of Republicans don't want to talk about religion, but if we are going to accurately identify the enemy we face so that we can fight well against them, we have to acknowledge that there's a spiritual element to it, not just political. Amen. Amen to every word. So Liz, I've got about two minutes. How do we fight back? We have to reorient our thinking, and I'll give you an example of one of the most interesting things I came across in the course of researching this book. I was researching the public school system in our country, and I realized it didn't become mandatory until the year 1852. Massachusetts was the first state to make public schooling compulsory, and the reason they did was because there was an influx of immigrants coming to our country at the time, particularly Catholic immigrants, and the Protestant politicians in charge of Massachusetts wanted to indoctrinate the immigrant children in American values so that they would be loyal to America first versus the country of their birth, and in Protestant doctrine because of this centuries-old battle between Protestants and Catholics. And I realized our education system actually is supposed to be an indoctrination center. That's what it was designed to do. Indoctrination itself, we think of negatively, but only because of what the left is indoctrinating children with. It's actually a morally neutral concept, and there's no such thing as neutrality in these institutions. If we do not put our principles, which are American values and Judeo-Christian principles, at the forefront and teach them to children with the public school system, then the Democrats are going to swoop in and indoctrinate kids with their ideology. So Republicans, I challenge Republicans in my book to rethink about how we view these institutions and to understand that it's okay for morals to prevail, not only in private, but in the public square. And that does not separate or that does not violate the separation of church and state. It's what these institutions were designed to do. Amen. Name of the book. Hide Your Children, Exposing the Marcus Marxists Behind the Attack on America's Kids from Liz Wheeler. Liz, that was, a, uh, that was a powerful 15 minutes. You're welcome back here anytime. It was good to have you, and good luck with the book. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. I appreciate it. You bet. Thoughts on that? You know, I loved the Mediaite uh, hit piece they attempted on you late last week about your relationship with Oklahoma uh, Public School Superintendent Ryan Walters. Oh, and how yeah, you, I forgot about how that you describe yeah. public <laughs> schools as Satan's youth ministry. But it's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. The dark gospel is pervasive throughout our public school system. And what is the dark gospel? I mean, it's kind of mentioned in, in Nefarious. But what is the dark gospel? It is wokeness. The real gospel says that you were born in the image of God, loved by God. But sin entered this world, and you can receive salvation through the sacrifice of another, God's one perfect true sacrifice in his son. The dark gospel is you were born wrong, whether it's because of the color of the skin or the genitals that you possess. And you can only receive absolution through mutilating yourself or subverting or uh, sacrificing your own humanity or your own agency as a, as a human being mm -hmm. in favor of X, Y, Z. That's just wrong. Marxism historically has been, a, uh, historically in the West, before what we're seeing now with woke, wokeness, has been the haves versus the have-nots, seizing the means of production. 
Now wokeness is just Marxism warmed over to fit an American uh, to fit an American audience mm-hmm. because we, re- we we rejected that in favor of capitalism. It's now pitting those who with white skin or the color of your skin or those who are born with the wrong genitals against X, Y, and Z. Yeah, it's pervasive. It's insidious. It is absolutely the definition of demonic. Yeah, they went from Das Kapital to Descent of Man. Yes, they realized that they had to speak. Marxism realized it had to speak, Todd, to the transcendent. And it yes. had to embrace the fact that it really was an alternative religious view uh, and, and worldview system, not just an alternative economic philosophy. And therefore, it con- like Descent of Man, it comprehensively applies beyond, that's Darwin applying his beliefs now beyond scientific discovery into a holistic moral framework. And that's what's happened with Marxism now. That's a, a lot of people, when she talks about uh, how self-loathing is part and parcel of this, and some people react without, a, without applying a religious sensibility to it. Well, how could that be? Why would you be self-loathing? But if you have a religious sensibility and understand how much the devil seeks to copy, just like the white witch in Aslan, uh, he, he desperately envies what God has. Steve, what you laid out, the two most important truths you talked about, number two, we're sinners. That means we're busted and we're broken, but it doesn't mean we're supposed to hate ourselves. It doesn't mean we're self-loathing, but they need a pale copy of that. They need you to be self-loathing. It is, that's not an accident. That That's their version of the sinner. Now we need to talk about who their God is. And the other thing, the sacred cause, read a history of the American education system and its development. Go no, from Noah Webster to John Dewey and, I, and how what the schools were intended to be and what they ultimately became and why. She just got it. It was the tip of the iceberg she got to go after right there. But you will learn so much about the history of this nation just by learning about the history of education and what it was intended for, who it applied to, and what it is now. And the cultural Marxists have studied this. This is why they are so acutely aware of why homeschooling is dangerous to them. That's why they are so acutely opposed to it. Because they will, I I can't remember who it was. It was some Democrat politician or maybe activist who came out recently and called for a total ban on homeschooling. Because why? Because the parents get to indoctrinate their children. They've studied this history. They know what's happening. Mm -hmm. They know what it's made for. And that's why they targeted the universities and the public Mm -hmm. education systems first in their Gramsci's long march through the institutions. Yes. Yep. I don't know, man. Liz gave Peter McCullough a run for his money, man, with the most truth bombs dropped in 15 minutes. Get that book. Yeah. That'll preach right there. Hour two is next. All right, back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Aaron McIntyre, Todd Erzin, and all of you. Let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox. Steve at stevedace.com is the email address. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And you can also find me over on Truth Social at Real Steve Dace. Again, that's at Real Steve Dace over there. And we'd love to find your five star review if you like the show and you listen to the podcast. You're a big part of our audience. And we'd love to find your five star review if you like us, of course. Now, if you don't, you know, don't lie, but if you kind of like the show, what if you, you know, like, it's okay. We would ask you to completely embellish and exaggerate then and just go right to five stars. We want every review to be one or five stars. That's what we're going for here. Extremes, extreme reactions that you either love this show or hate it because that means we, at least we think it means that we're walking the narrow road because that's the kind of reaction the narrow road should get. It should get devotion or damnation, one or the other. Uh, and thank you to all of you that have left us those five star reviews already hit subscribe or follow as well Uh, follow in the case of iTunes that way you know every time we do a new episode it shows up in your feed every single time that we do one this portion of the show brought to you by friends over at Miracle Made Sheets did you know that Body temp at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality if you wake up too hot or too cold 
I highly recommend you check out Miracle Maid's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Maid uses silver infused fabrics that makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. I told you guys during the summer and the heat how much these sheets just absolutely killed it. This is the first summer I have not had to have the ceiling fan on virtually every night. And we had a much hotter summer than we did the last couple. Okay. Um, but then I kind of wonder, well, how's this going to work now when it gets cool out? Perfect snuggling weather, man. So I got the thick blanket for the snuggle, but I'm not overheated because I'm still getting the temperature regulation underneath the blanket from the Miracle Made sheets. I love these things, and they're so comfortable at the same time. It, it's not just the functionality, but man, they're, they're just they're comfy. So I would highly recommend them. If you want to try them today, go to trymiracle.com slash dace. Uh, that's trymiracle.com slash dace. If you go there today, you're going to save over 40% off. And, and there's more. If you use the promo code dace at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20% on top of that. You can't beat it. Even more savings. Just trymiracle.com slash dace and use the promo code dace at checkout for extra savings. Trymiracle.com slash dace. Check out code dace for extra big savings. All right, so nothing from Dr. Ryan Cole? Unfortunately, no. Okay, so Todd, let's try to, we're going to, let's do this. I'm going to do Theology Thursday now. And let's see if we can get him maybe in, at this time on Thursday instead. Okay. Okay. Because and maybe this is providential because I think this does kind of tie in to what we were discussing at the top of the show. All right. Um, wait a minute. He's texting me now. Uh, he says he's ready. Want to okay. try him again? I'll try him again. All right. Let's, let's try him again if, he's, if we've got him standing by. I said he was having some tech difficulties. So he says he's ready. Yeah. Let's try him again. As he works this out, Rashida Tlaib is flying a Palestinian flag alongside a pride flag outside her office. How's that for Theology Thursday? That, thank, you for, thank you for telling us the truth. I mean, how about BLM coming out today in defense of their, yeah. of their, of their Palestinian brethren? See, I, just let's get everybody on the record and everybody let's just be brutally honest about what everybody is for. And who everybody is for. And we'll get along a lot better here. It's, see, this is where our worldview shines, is when there's clarity. The, the problem is the enemy is, is, is not eager to provide us said clarity. That's why we need to be discerning. The enemy is not eager to provide us said clarity. About this particular enemy? Unless, did- unless, they, unless he thinks that he's got a massive advantage and he's playing on offense... Then we let the freak flag fly, and I think that's what the enemy thinks. That's where the enemy thinks we are now, that, that now he can give us clarity because he's in control now. That's what I think. Still nothing. We're going to have to just reschedule. All right, let's just reschedule then. We'll do that. All right, so that, that, that does segue into what we want to talk about here and what I had planned for Theology Thursday anyway. And um, I want to show you a tweet from a very, very popular Twitter account on the right. A guy named Mike Cernovich. Um, this is responding to defense, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. I have ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip. There will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting human animals and we will act accordingly. And Mike Cernovich responded, quote, pro-life Christians won't say a damn thing, will they? Remember the two cosmic truths on Theology Tuesday, uh, the, two, the two cosmic truths that I shared with you at the top of the show. And I said they're the most important two things you can ever glean from our program, more important than anything we've ever said prior, more important than anything we will ever say after, is to remember these two things. You are owed nothing from God. God is the aggrieved party. We violated him. We broke covenant with him. And he could have just walked away. He didn't owe us a law. He didn't owe us a Messiah. He didn't owe us any salvation. He didn't owe us a path. He didn't owe us air. Didn't owe us food. Didn't owe us water. Didn't owe us anything. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And yet provides all those things anyway. Because at 
the heart of God is love. Now, he defines what that means. God is love, but love is not God. So, for example, if you read the Bible, then there actually is no reason to condemn what the Israeli defense minister said. Let me explain why. Because we've seen God bring forth angels of death, plagues, even human armies to extinguish his enemies and the enemies of his people. And that when Messiah returns, it will be to wage the last war with a robe dipped in blood and a sword in his mouth. The only argument here, actually, is if you think theologically that this Israel is no longer representative of God's covenant people. And there are numerous Christian denominations and sects that do feel that way. Sometimes it's, re- it's referred to as replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel in the New Testament. So if, if you feel that way, if that is your theology, then I understand why you have difficulty with what the Israeli defense minister said. Because you don't, you don't view the Jewish people as God's covenant people anymore. You don't view this Israel as God's, as representative of God's lasting covenant with the Jews. But instead believe that that covenant ended with the advent of the church. Did you get the idea, though, that Mike Cernovich was, a, was, was asserting oh, that no. level of distinction? No. <laughs> no. No. No, this is a scoff. No, no, this was scoffing. Yes. And see, what, because here, here's what Mike is doing. I don't know Mike, never met him. I just know the type. It's his own version of replacement theory yes, is what yeah. it is. Mike, is. Mike is ascribing his instincts upon God and his word. And, and he does so claiming to be humble. I can't believe you guys won't speak against such an atrocity. What's an atrocity? So let me get this straight. It's, it's an atrocity to murder your landlord's children and behead their babies. And then you have the unmitigated gall to turn around and say, why did my landlord uh, uh, turn off the utilities? The landlord is the aggrieved party. Not you. But see, you'll have a hard time admitting these things if you won't admit you're a sinner. You're entitled to nothing. Nothing. God could have Thanos snapped every synapse in your brain and not even permitted you the opportunity to have motor function. Could have fed him in his all, and it would have all been owed because we broke covenant with him. He owes us nothing. Now, I I know even a lot of American Christians have been taught that basically you went to a style of church that figured out how to trick you into asking God at Jesus into your heart against your own will. That's not true. That's a scam, too. That's a lie. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the father who sent me sends them to me. And then I will raise them up on the last day. God always must initiate. We can never initiate with God. Even if you are a hardcore Arminian and one day we'll maybe do a theology Thursday on these topics. There is, there is no salvation for you to freely choose unless God takes the initiative to send his son. God always must initiate with us because we are sinners. God does not have to initiate with us because we are sinners. Let me say that again. One more time for the people in the way back. God always has to initiate with us because we are sinners. God does not have to initiate with us because we are sinners. That's why it's called grace. You are receiving something you do not deserve. None of us do. Salvation is by faith through the free gift of grace, lest any man would boast. No one has a claim upon God. No one does. 
No one is owed anything. Some will look at the decadence of modern Israeli culture. They have pride parades, a very high abortion rate, and they will say things like, that's evidence that this is no longer the Israel of God's covenant. The problem is your assertion is a self-refutation. Whose covenant is it? Is it the Israeli covenant? It is God's covenant. Can humans make covenants with God? No, we can't keep them. He always has to make covenants with us. Did Noah walk out into the wilderness in pre-flood times and say to this unknown God out there, there I am so super moral. Can you show me a path of justice for this immoral world in which I live? No, God chose Noah. Abraham left his father according to rabbinic tradition. His father was an idol maker in Terah. And he walked out of his dad's idol, this is his dad's idol store, and looked up in the sky on his own and he said, there must be, uh, there must be something better than this idol made of wood that my old man makes. And so I look up at you in the clouds and I choose you. And the being in the clouds said, man, I was just sitting idly by waiting for someone to find me. No. God had to call Abraham too. And he had to call you and me and everyone else. Well, if I had lived in the times when the, when the Israelites lived and saw those great miracles. No. You wouldn't have. You see miracles now. You see people walk away from addictions. You see people healed. You see families brought together. You see marriages resurrected. You still don't want to believe. You can't. God must initiate. You're a sinner. We're owed nothing. God owns this all. So when God says to the Israelites, go into Canaan and hit control, alt, delete. Everything belongs to him. He can do what he wants with it. Well, I, I don't want to worship a God that would blankety blank. Well, that would make you God. And I don't want to worship you. So we'll call it even. We're owed nothing. When we think we're owed something, we will draw silly moral equivalences here like Cernovich does. When we won't admit we're sinners, we'll draw these kinds of silly moral equivalencies. We're owed nothing. I cannot say this enough. And yet, yet the same God that sent the Israelites into Canaan to permanently erase those civilizations for their idolatry. Up until the moment of that judgment, did he not give them air to breathe, Todd? Yes. Did he not give them gravity upon which they could yes. securely walk upon the ground? Correct. Did he not give them wa water? Yes. Food? Yes. Did he have to do that? No. So the whole time that they are idolaters, the whole time that they are violating him, is he not still providing for them? Right. And so at the moment when he says enough is enough, and these these nomads, these people with no, of no land of their own, these Semites, I'm going to take you out of literally nothing, and you will be my in instrument of judgment against those people. Was he not ju justified in doing so? He was. Long before he actually did it, was he not? So again, who's the aggrieved party here? God is. Not the people punished. And furthermore, to demonstrate his character, when God's own people that he chose, when they descended into similar idolatry, did he let it go because they had special favor from him? No. No, he punished them too, did he not? Yes. And severely, did he not? He did. And in some of the same ways that he punished the pagans, did he not? Oh, they yes. were removed from the land, were they not? Yes. They, were, they, they, they then faced the same level of executioner that they were once the instrument of, were they not? Yeah, this is what the sin of Achan or Achan yeah, in Achan, within the yes, book of Joshua. Yes, yeah. 
This is the this is the loss of the of the of the northern ten tribes lost to history by the Assyrian armies. Just as the just as the people of Canaan they were called and displaced were lost to history, so were the northern ten tribes lost to history by the Assyrians. For the same penalty, idolatry, which is demonic. You realize you're preaching a language that is no less lost than the story you told yesterday of uh, re- rediscovering uh, Deuteronomy uh, in the temple under the oh, time the story of, Josiah. of Josiah. Yes, this is what you're you're that guy right now trying to get people to understand what has been lost. I went and found just to show you what happens when we put ourselves in the judgment seat. I went and found I was going to save this for Thursday. This is a dissertation from the Gospel Coalition dated February 13th, 2013 on how could God command genocide in the Old Testament. One of our colleagues is out there yelling, using the term genocide randomly all over the place right now. Yes. But again, this is done with the idea that you are owed something. You're not. God doesn't owe the people of Gaza anything. Anything. And he doesn't owe America anything because he doesn't owe anyone anything. Are they sinners in Gaza? Yes. Are we sinners here? Yes. So what does he owe us? Nothing. Nothing. And up until the moment that God will use the Israeli defense force as an instrument of justice for the atrocities they committed, do they still not right now have air to breathe? Yes. Could they still not right now go and marry? Yes. Could they still not right now hug a loved one? Yes. Could they still not right now eat food? Yes. Are they entitled to any of that? No. No. But does he still provide that? Correct. Even up to the moment of the reckoning, does God provide that? Yes. So again, what are we owed? Nothing. 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 Now, the Gospel Coalition would never write this article these days. I can't even believe it's still up on the site. It's one of those things that post-Trump has decided to just wreck themselves. Here are, the, here are the talking points from this blog. And it's written by a guy named Justin Taylor. Number one is the maker of all things and the ruler of all people. God has absolute rights of ownership over all peoples and all places. Number two, God is not only the ultimate maker, ruler, and owner, but he is just and righteous in all that he does. Number three, all of us deserve God's judgment. None of us deserves God's mercy. Number four, the Canaanites were enemies of God who deserved to be punished. Number five, God's actions were not an example of ethnic cleansing. Number six, why was it necessary to remove the Canaanites from the land? Number seven, the destruction of the Canaanites is a picture of the final judgment. Could you see the Gospel Coalition running this article today? No. Not in a million years. Is this David French approved? No. This ain't Russell Moore, David French approved, but it's an extremely biblical article. It's narrow road stuff. It's the stuff of God is God and we are not. We're not entitled to anything. I want to keep stressing this point. God owes you nothing. Owes me nothing. Owes no one anything. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He does not owe you a path to redemption, yet he offers one. He does not know the unjust. He does not owe them anything, and yet he makes the rain fall on them nevertheless. Up until their leaders that they never tried to overthrow, up until their leaders that they never rebelled against or revolted against and said, this is not a proper expression of Islam. We, we don't want to live in a country that's run by Hamas. Have we seen those kinds of demonstrations and revolts in, in, mm. in, in, in Gaza over the last 10, 20 years? Has it seemed too much of that? No. Well, up until all the times they didn't do that, did God permit them orgasms? Did he permit them procreation? Did he permit them marriage? Did he permit them food? Did he permit them love? Did he permit them companionship? All this time that they completely turned their backs on his law. Did did he still provide those things? They have not been swallowed into the earth as far as I can tell. They have not. And how many of those things did they earn? How many of them were they owed? The whole time they are blaspheming him. The whole time. And threatening his people. How much of those things were they owed? None of them. And for the nation of Israel with its pride parades and its abortion rates, how much of God's mercy and justice is it owed? None. None. Because a covenant doesn't, with God does not rest on the character of us as people, 
but on the character of God. And that's the only way these covenants get kept. None would choose him, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All are like sheep and easily led astray. A lot of terms of totality there, not much distinction. Mm. The word all used quite frequently. And when you look it up in the original Greek or Hebrew, you know what you're going to find it means? All. You can use a lot of big words, a lot of inflammatory, emotional, incendiary reflexivism. And you'll generate a lot of clicks from a lot of scoffers online. But it's dumber than a box of rocks. You're not smart. You're Romans 1. Your foolish hearts have been darkened. While pretending to be wise, you become other fools. God owes you and I nothing. And he's never owed anybody anything. And he never will. He is owed. And despite all he gives and all he grants, we still look at obedience and submission to him like a curse. And that's if we even consider those things at all. Gentlemen, your thoughts. You know, one of the things, one of the symptoms of Romans 1, the foolish hearts were darkened, that I have witnessed numerous times, is how Satan uh, uses as a tool when, um, when thinking about issues, thinking about uh, things that are going on in our world. Satan will often make complex things simple and simple things complex. Mm. And that's what we've seen here. And why does he do that? Because it results in chaos. Things that are complicated. What we the, the conversation that we just had here, starting with the uh, the uh, re- replacement theology, going up until uh, what you just talked about here. We're talking about the character of God that requires a relationship with God, knowledge of God to help us understand His ways deeper. And at the end of, uh, end of the day, the conclusions that we drew, drew when you understand the character of God, when you understand that we owe him nothing, as you have repeatedly said here, the conclusions are fairly simple, but you have to go through this. It's not just a simple conflation. It's not just a simple run-of-the-mill ru- r- rule of thumb. Satan also makes simple things complex. We see that every day. We just had that conversation with Liz Wheeler talking about schools. Sex is designed for marriage, one man and one woman. But no, we see that on the other end of the spectrum. No, it's actually complicated. It's it's on a spectrum. Gender gender is a thing and it's on uh, on a spectrum. Ultimately, what this boils down to, especially in our day and age, where we have more access to information arguably more access to truth if we want it than ever before. This results in just chaotic, as our old friend Todd Friel says, stinking thinking. It is foolish hearts were darkened. It is, and the result of all of this, is a a, a preponderance of scoffers. A preponderance of them. So it's important to confront, I believe, what we just did here, Steve. But ultimately, these people, yes, they are made in the image of God. We should pray for them. Honestly, people like Mike Cernovich, I feel sorry for him. And uh, we should pray for them. But good gravy, uh, for whatever reason, whatever their motivation is, do not engage with the scoffing. It's important to confront it once, but... Going forward, if you see this guy popping up on your timeline, I, I would. This is just my opinion. Uh, scoffers are as scoffers do, uh, do, and I just, I think we should spit this out of our mouth, which we did here. The character of God, the character of God. You kept talking about that over and over again. That is the point I was trying to make, and, and several of you emailed me uh, about it positively. Uh, what I think it was two weeks ago when I talked about the uh, story of Abraham and people. That's a hard teaching. That's a hard teaching. Well, it's a salvational teaching. 
Abraham, again, was worshiping God, but he didn't know him as the one true God. He was, it was a, 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 he thought he was worshiping in a land of many, many gods. God was trying to break him of that. It was a mercy what was done to him because he showed you his character. You were worshiping it. All the other gods he's showing you, you worship that way. It's always leading to death. It's always leading to death. I and I alone will save you from that. This is the point Steve is trying to make. You worship other gods or you worship God the way you want to instead of the way he called you to. The end of that, it's death. It's a one plus one equals two. It is his mercy that he saves you from that through the story, examples of the story of Abraham. I, I, it can't be made more plain than that. You can try to turn this into a level of calculus and solving a new kind of Rubik's Cube. You will fail the same way that everybody has failed in the generations before you. You will get the same swallowing up of the earth. You will get the same Sodom and Gomorrah. There is no other way than God's way. I want to go to something that Liz Wheeler said a few minutes ago on the show to conclude this talking about we're going to have to be more open in discussing spiritual and religious themes when discussing the issues of the day. And of course, we have been doing that on yes. our show for quite some time. But the temptation will be the more secularized and biblically ignorant we become. The temptation for, for us who have a biblical worldview will be to try and speak in more general terms. Wrong impulse, the opposite. Speak in more explicitly biblical terms now. Do not assume someone coming at you from the right is not an idolater. They probably are. We're down to the remnant now, man. When you're, when you're a majority in a culture, you can speak in general terms because pretty much everybody has been infused with some level of your worldview, so they get where you're coming from even if they don't prescribe to it. So speaking in general terms we all agree upon is acceptable in such a culture. Are we that culture today? Not even close. Not even close. So you need to speak evangelistically and apostolically now, not philosophically. Speak more explicitly in biblical terms. Speak more explicitly in biblical analogies. Because you cannot assume, even the people you that you vote similar to, you cannot assume they're doing so for the same reasons you are. We are a post-Christian country. And the sooner we get to acknowledging that the sooner we can finally come up with something to do something about it. So last month, the G20 nations announced a plan to impose digital currencies and digital IDs on their respective populations. Black Mirror episodes becoming increasingly realistic. Central bank digital currencies essentially allow government to track every purchase you make. Could even allow officials to prohibit you from purchasing certain products or easily freeze or seize part or all of your assets. In essence, this would enable government to take more control over your finances. That's why concerned Americans are diversifying their assets into physical gold with the help of Birch Gold Group. If you want a physical asset held in a tax-sheltered retirement account, you should call Birch Gold too. But learn for yourself by texting Steve to 989-898. That's text Steve to 989-898, and they'll send you a free info kit on gold, and that's the easiest way to become a Birch Gold customer. Text Steve to 989-898. Claim your free info kit on gold, and then call them, because if digital currency becomes a reality, it'll be nice to have some gold to fall back on. Text Steve at 989-898. Let's welcome in my oldest daughter, Anastasia. Good to see you, sweetie. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Dad? I've been a little worked up today, but we'll, we'll try to calm down now a little bit now that you're here. So what do you got for us? So back by popular demand, we're going to play Two Truths, One Lie. So again, how this works is I'll read every one of you sent me your submissions. So um, there will be three statements. Two of them are true and one of them is a lie. And then it'll be up to the other two to decide which one is the lie. Okay. All right. So we'll go with Aaron's first. All right. Aaron, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Aaron's is one. I recorded, mixed, and produced an entire music album when I was in high school. Two, I minored in business while in college. And three, I slept in the same bed as a lobbyist. 
I was so worried about reading that one that I'd have like a for, like a slip and accidentally be like I slept with a lobbyist. With a lobbyist. Yeah. See, so. I actually wrote that first, and then I realized <laughs> that sounds kind of bad. Yeah, I was so nervous about reading that. <sighs> I am. I am thinking minoring in business at Northwestern Bible College. They have a robust business program. <laughs> Can, is it smoked? <laughs> Maybe today. <Is> yeah. <laughs> there are some he- there are some people that got smoked during the last theology Thursday or Tuesday. That's true. I'm going to say minoring in business at Northwestern Bible College is the lie. Um, the third sleeping in the same bed as a lobbyist just seems such an obscure thing to conjure up that you wouldn't mm. just make that up on your own. It has <laughs> to be true. He definitely did that. And I could definitely see Aaron mixing down an album. What yeah. kind of album was it again? It just says, I recorded, mixed, and produced an entire music album when mm-hmm. I was in high school. I this could see is, Aaron doing that. Yeah. Uh, and the first one is a lie. And this, and McIntyre, this is a total McIntyre move that we caught him doing last time. Where part of this first one is true. Like, he, he probably mixed and did two of the things, but the third one, I mean, he did this exact thing last okay, time. Okay, what are the three so things the again? Say it again. One more time. Say it again. One more time. Number one, I recorded, mixed, and produced an entire music album when I was in high school. See, I could see that. Remember, dude's sister's like a world-class opera plays. singer. I know. Okay, so I, know, I could see that maybe being her stuff. Yeah, something about that. That he recorded her, he mixed it, and produced it for her. Yeah. Like, like I could see that. All right? So I'm going to stick with, uh, I'm going to stick with I minored in business at Northwestern Bible College. As the lie, I'm Something gonna stick with that, that as the lie, one. and it's and it's robust, uh, completely smoked business school. All right, you're with the first one. Yep, the first one's a All lie right. on some level. Steve is correct. I started mm-hmm. a minor in business. I took business law at Northwestern, then I got super busy and dropped the minor. Uh, I did, I did do an entire album. I did lead vocals, backing vocals, lead guitar, electric oh, it's guitar. It's worse than we thought. Bass, <laughs> drums. I had to rely on MIDI and stuff, so I, I don't know how to play the drums did some other instruments as well in, in that album. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there's no trace of that album. Year of the that Cat? You will ever... No, I didn't discover Year of the Cat until I started uh, working for you. I think that's the first time I ever, okay. ever heard it. Uh, I Is did it smoked? sleep in the same bed <laughs> as a lobbyist back, uh, back um, before my sister and brother-in-law were married. My brother-in-law was doing some lobbying work for the organization that would become known as the family leader. We were all, my parents, yep. my sister and brother-in-law, were all heading back from Spokane, Washington one trip. We stayed in a hotel and I slept in the same bed as he did because we didn't want to spring for multiple rooms. I'm sure Dave enjoys being referred to as a lobbyist. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I sure him, you, I'm sure you won't be hearing from him, him after the fact uh, I made him all. very uncomfortable yes. the next morning. Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, Todd's, here we go. All right. One, my dad was in the Air Force. Two, my mom was adopted. And three, my daughter's soccer coach threw their team trophies in the garbage. That one I, is I, the truth. That I, last I, one is the you, truth. I, you think the last one's true? Yeah. I, I have a hard time. Why would you even want to make up that your mom was adopted and your dad was in the service, though? <laughs> Why would you want to make that up? You yeah. know? Yeah. Like, psych, she's my real mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you'd want to make that up, though. I mean, I, I, that doesn't seem like an Urzen play to make stuff like, it seems like an, a McIntyre play to make that up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but it, it doesn't seem like an Urzen play to make those kinds of, you know. I really appreciate that there's that gap of understanding between me and Aaron right yeah. there. That, yeah, I'm, thank I'm, you for I'm, that. I'm, I'm in, I've imbued you uh, with a little <laughs> different level of integrity that I'm willing to offer to Aaron. Um, uh, so I'm the, gonna, la- the last one is true. I'm going to say the last one is the lie. Okay. Because... It, uh, I think it involves soccer, and the other two are such serious topics that I just can't see Erzin being frivolous with those topics. So, I, I mean, Todd's talked about his daughters. I don't know which soccer coach this is, but the one at Arkansas is like a pretty serious dude. I could see him doing this. All right, I'm going to say the soccer trophies in the trash. Is the lie. Is the lie. So which one is the lie, and which one do I think is the lie? I think he's making up that his dad was in the Air Force. Okay. Which one is it, Todd? Aaron is correct. My dad was in the Navy. Okay. So, so your dad was in a different service. <laughs> All right. That I, I can see then. 
So the other two are truths. The other two were true. What was yeah. the What was the reason for throwing the trophies in the trash? And it just it was I I, I was doing this this morning as i getting the text from the pictures from my daughter arkansas was uh ranked uh top 10 and played auburn on sunday who was not ranked and auburn upset us and as a motivational tool the girls showed up to the locker room for practice this morning and their ncaa trophies were like like one was laying in the bushes <laughs> one was in a garbage bag wow. on the ground one oh, was wow. in a tra- yeah he's like it's time to understand who we are and what you think about who you think you are and who's God in this picture. And it ain't you message sent. Mm. I like him already. <laughs> Unfortunately, he just chose to coach soccer. All right, go ahead. Okay. And then dad's is the last one. Okay. So number one, I once got grounded as a little kid and made to ride a big wheel through our trailer park with a diaper on for whining like a baby. Two, the department store I bought my wife's wedding ring later became Rob Bell's church building. And three, my first concert was Hootie and the Blowfish. I need the first one to be true. Does it say the <laughs> first one again? That is. Okay. <laughs> I'll read it again. I need that to be true. <laughs> that is Chris Christie French fries. <laughs> Number one. Kismet to it. <laughs> I once got grounded as a little kid and made to ride a big wheel through our trailer park with a diaper on for whining God, like a baby. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you think is the lie? I think the last one, the hoodie, is the lie. That's kind of where I'm leaning, because Rob Bell got his start in Grand Rapids, which is where you lived oh, for wow. a long time. Details on mm. that one. Wow, that was a good poll. Um, yeah. Did not know that. Yeah. So I could totally see that. The last one is so benign, but I feel like Steve is doing some sort of Sith or Jedi mind trick. I can't. I haven't made up if it's Sith or Jedi. Like the more we've done this, we all are starting to like do four dimensional chess on each other. <laughs> yeah. What was he thinking? And we were like eating our <laughs> yes. cereal. And like yes. that's all the, we were doing. The first one is a lie. The third one is the lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. I was whining very badly. Uh, I was, I think, kindergarten. And I was whining very badly to my mom one day. And um, Oh, Vicky made you yeah, do this. Yeah, she oh, did. She wasn't messing around. That a girl. Yeah, she, she put me in a diaper, and we lived in a trailer park in Des Moines. And I rode around the, had to ride around the trailer park with a diaper on. Wow, ride my big wheel. tough love. Since I was acting like a baby, I needed to man up, man. She got sick of hearing it. So... Um, and then the second one, uh, I, I bought Amy's engagement ring, which, of course, became the base for her wedding ring, at a now defunct department store that was local in Grand Rapids called Whitmark Department Stores. And that building was purchased by Rob Bell's congregation uh, about a year or two later after I bought Amy's ring there. And it became the home building for his church, um, you know, when he was just quasi heretical before he became fully so. And then the third one, the first concert I paid a ticket to see was Hootie and the Blowfish. That is true. So but it was not the first concert I was at. So technically <laughs> the first concert technically. I <laughs> The first concert I went to was the my senior in high school. We were all playing uh, basketball in a in a park and um the rock station in Grand Rapids, I want to say it was WLAV. Does that sound right, maybe? Uh, we didn't know uh, was having like a, a, a rock in the park concert festival. So we went over there to check out who was in town for this in Grand Rapids. And performing on the stage was none other than soap opera actor Michael Damien, who had like a top 10 song at that time that does not count okay which was a remake of a song actually you know that's rock homeless, on i think is what it was called that's a homeless person in the park that's not <laughs> that's not a concert so the first concert i actually ever went to was michael damien the soap opera that's, star but the first one i bought a ticket to see that's worse than a lie that's just sad <laughs> in our defense we didn't know todd what's the first concert you went to I uh, won tickets on the radio. My buddy actually won them and asked me to go. I saw a heart. Wow. Oh, wow. It was really good. Yeah. It was loud. Wow. So how long ago was that? I was in like 
seventh or eighth grade. Okay. So, so like we're talking mid eighties. Yeah. You know, so like these dreams. What about the, love and these dreams? Yeah, that was, yeah, that that was the big album they yeah. had. At the, so they had the big hair going then too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did they, were they, were they still doing like, um, crazy on you oh, and magic Barracuda. man? Were they still doing that oh, yeah. from dreamboat Annie days? Yeah. Okay. All right. Casting crowns. Yeah, I've been to a Casting Crowns concert. I paid t- tickets for That's Casting Crowns. That's the most Crowns. homeschooler thing ever. The <laughs> yeah, first, yeah. paid tickets. I think the first ever <laughs> concert that I paid tickets to was Tenth Avenue North, which I don't think they even do anything anymore. Oh no, yeah, I've that. heard of them though. I've 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 seen Casting Crowns. They were great. Their drummer was incredible. You know what's uh, a really saw Mercy under- Me in concert. Saw underrated. Them too. Uh, yeah, Mercy Me is a really underrated yep. live band, actually. Yeah christian man yeah so i mean i've done some of the uh not homeschool kid but uh some of the homeschool parent box checking Anna, what was you your were a first? bad homeschool parent dad because mine was taylor swift fearless but, but that was back when she was just you know a, a, a not cute an country star fi- is taylor swift the antichrist now never that, to me yeah never to you that that was that was back when we were you know still playing you belong with me on rock band in the basement yeah, it was a different. That is true. That was a different era. It was a more wholesome That was one time. of her eras, and now she's on her era's tour. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> I see what you did there. Did you do that on purpose? I did not. No. I okay. Re- but after I did, I thought that was kind of clever what I just did. It yeah. was. Yeah. You know, I texted Jill Savage the other day, and it was like, "You've got to go on the show and defend Taylor Swift for me pretty soon." Here, that's it, what I said. She is a sw- Jill is she a Swiftie. She is a Swiftie. She's a strong Swiftie. Is that. she really? Yeah. We talk about it all the time. Wow. You guys didn't know that. I know. No, I did not know that. No. Maybe that was a secret. Sorry, Jill. Swifties, Swifties don't need to be defending. They're running the earth right now. We need to be defended. Well, the, the problem Aaron's is... football team needs to be defended. Oh, I was so disappointed on Sunday. I got all excited to watch the Vikings game with Steven, and then the announcer was like, Taylor Swift is not here. And I was like, I have other things to do. Really? <laughs> no, Tra- I sat and watched the game. Travis Kelsey had an ankle injury that he shook off. I did. <laughs> yeah, but now he's, not, now he's not practicing. No, he practiced today. Did he practice today? Because yeah. he didn't practice yesterday, right? Yeah, he practiced today. Okay. Aaron, I saw what you did there. Yeah, thank you. I appreciated it. I love that album. 21, 21 was great. I'm I have ashamed. a lot of great memories of you and I playing uh, You Belong With Me. And what was the other one from that album? Love Story you yep. liked a lot. There was, I have a lot of great memories of you and I and, and <laughs> Zoe and Noah when they were little playing rock band in the basement in the wintertime. And we, we played those songs constantly you wanted to play them <laughs> constantly so i've got a lot of good memories where that's concerned um for people that don't know by the way jill has a fancy new job we won't say where but she has a fancy new job and they don't want her out there on shows like this giving divisive and incendiary opinions <laughs> All right. So that's why you haven't seen her for the last few weeks. She's got a fancy new job. So we miss her. Now she talks to Anna, but not to us because <laughs> we're, we are we are verboten. OK, I mean, we, we will uh, we will cost her this fancy new job if she speaks to us. So she only speaks career to crushing. You now. Yes. <laughs> including to our own careers. Including to our own careers, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Is it smoked? <laughs> yes. In fact, it is. All right. Thank you, princess. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's wrap it up here. We've got about two minutes, gentlemen. Uh, your thoughts on today's show? Can unemployment be smoked? That's what I'm, I'm wondering. Every single month, dude. Every month we have this early report. Many more jobs created than forecast, which is not even true. And then, and yes, when you look at the actual raw numbers, it's not true. And then at the end of the month, they always have to revise what they. How many months in a row every, has this happened? I think every one of them. It seems like it's been like over a year that this has happened every single month. What else, Todd? You. Well, today kind of feels like an unofficial, official turning of a page for this show and what you, how you called an audible on Theology Thursday. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. Like, we can't do enough to dispose the modern day church of its false notions of worship and truth. I, you know, I start with my own tribe, uh, the Catholic uh, church uh, and its various levels of Pope Francis confusion. We don't have time for this. We must be the light in the darkness. Well, the, 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 there's, if we could do a show every day where I pick somebody with a, with a following in writing media that I has to take a disagree with and I respond to it. Why don't we do that? Well, because it's incredibly divisive, number one. Number two, therefore, it can often be 
not very constructive. And number three, it becomes which one of the, which one of us do you like the best as opposed to which one of us is the most correct. I'm going to make an except. That's why we don't do it. I will make an exception. I won't make an exception over our campaign or candidates. A lot of times not even over issues. But when we start getting into the arena now of scoffing at the faith and, and slandering the brethren, that to me now is I believe, you know, I have a responsibility to defend the faith. And that's why I did it in this case. So that's that's the difference Amen. here compared to just another primary election or any election or any other issue. All right, that's going to do it for today's show. We're going to stick around and record overtime for Blaze TV subscribers. For the rest of you, we'll see you tomorrow, noon to 2 Eastern after Glenn Beck. Until then, John 317.